roughly the 1970s when a recession, we had a terrible recession and high inflation. And as a result, uh, public funding for parks and community programs, including community sports, declined. And when that happened, uh, this was the beginning of private um, teams and leagues starting to fill the void in what had been there with the community programs. At the same time, we had Title IX, which hugely accelerated the number of girls playing sports. So there was a greater demand for sports as well. The perspective of parents and what they owed their kids started to shift, also beginning around the 70s, um, when the cultural sort of pressure became to move away from any collective sense of responsibility to rearing kids to shifting almost entirely to the family. And as a result, parents felt they needed to step up and do everything possible, everything they could to uh, give their kids every advantage. It's all defined by economic anxiety, concern about the future. And all of these forces kind of converged along with the greater stakes in college. And we all know about college and how crazy that can be to make youth sports, to turn them from what they had been, which was primarily community-based, low cost, local, cheap, to now um, kind of a feast or famine situation where low income areas have very little and middle to upper income areas have, is almost all privatized or the quality programs are privatized and serious. <laughs> Youth sports in this country differ dramatically from youth sports in other countries, in other parts of the world, I should say. In China, and we've seen this in the Olympics, it's a top-down federal selection of the top athletes, and then they're, they're plucked out and cultivated, you know, pulled from their families and developed. Obviously very different from how we do it here. In um, the developing countries, you know, poorer countries, uh, there aren't really kind of any organized youth sports to speak of that are state run or even private. Many of them are sort of NGO based on NGOs, which uh, use youth sports to kind of bring up the population. In Europe, youth sports there are, are not school-based, they're community-based. While schools have PE or physical education, they don't have uh, school teams. So sports are community-based, local, cheap. The emphasis is on um, developing kids' agility, having fun. Um, some, there are smaller teams. And Norway is the model we all hold up as the ideal for uh, the United States or any country to follow because they have incredible success rate, participation rate in Norway among kids. 93% of kids play sports. They have enormous medal counts at uh, the Olympics. And they just have a culture that's really geared towards children and their development and their enjoyment of sports rather than our system, which is kind of based around adults and adult supervision, seriousness, competition. You know, we have age group champions for second graders. They don't have any of that in, um, certainly in Norway, not most of Europe. bottom line is that household income is the driving factor in who plays and who doesn't play. Data is very hard to come by in youth sports because there's no sort of government body that collects it. So the Aspen Institute has stepped in and they've studied the uh, income uh, participation rates on teams and activity levels and, you know, matched it with income. They're directly correlated so that in families where um, the household income is less than $25,000, they're three times as likely to be inactive as in households with over $100,000. That those same low income families are half as likely to be on a team. So there, are, the money alone is an enormous barrier to entry for low income families. And there's also the time um, investment that parents are expected or required to make if they're going to join these teams. A good chunk of parents spend 20 hours a week on their children's sport, which is just simply impossible for low-income families if you're juggling jobs and 
you can't drive hither and yon on weekends and after school. You have maybe you have more kids. It's, it's just it's just a massive barrier to entry. So as a result, sports have become entirely linked to class. The other factor here is that low income schools also don't have sports options the way uh, middle and upper income schools do. At least a third of the lowest income schools have no school sports at all. It's unavoidable. The, the link between physical activity and income. Obesity rates are higher among low income kids, low income families. Most of them will remain obese um, as adults. And during the pandemic, we saw that the obesity rate went up to 22% of kids between the ages of two and 19, which is kind of mind boggling. <laughs> good news about the pandemic is that it had the effect of pushing kids outside. It kind of returned them back to the roots of playing basketball outside, you know, going for runs or rides. If, if you live in that kind of community where that's possible, I certainly saw it where I live. Bike sales went way up. You couldn't get a bike around here. So that was the good news. Now, of course, the bad news was, at least as far as sports participation goes, is that both the school teams and the travel teams basically shut down, at least for a while. And of course, it depended on the state. Blue states, they tended to shut down for longer. But what's been happening more recently is that there's been a stalling of the free play, the biking, you know, those individual type sports or things you could play outside and a return to travel and um, school teams. But we've also seen a return to investing in um, the travel teams so that more than half of parents are now spending and devoting the same or more time to their kids sports as they were before the pandemic. And this again is class based. Meanwhile, Hispanic and black families are spending less and devoting less time to youth sports since the pandemic has largely ended, or at least as far as sports participation goes. So we're kind of seeing a return to what we had before the pandemic with you know, class-based differences being hardened or worsened, as long as the incentives remain the way they are, I, can't, I don't see that changing. Most parents would say, at least older parents would say, one of the hardest things about having kids is keeping perspective. To keep perspective, start by asking yourself some questions to find out whether you have in fact lost, lost it. And one is to say, you go to a party, how long does it take you to start bringing up that your child plays sports? If it's less than five minutes, it's probably not great. Would it be devastating to you if your child quit? Also probably not great. It probably means that it, it's taken on greater importance to you than it should have. So to keep perspective, if you agree you've lost it, you know, there are various tricks you can do. I encourage you to uh, ask older people who've been through this for guidance. It's very hard to know when you're in the thick of it what's right. Practice distancing. You know, they say pretend you're a fly on the wall and observe this situation as if you were an outsider. Um, that might help you kind of see, okay, you're too enmeshed. Another is to advi practice advising a friend. What would you tell a friend who is in a situation? You know, if they say, should I, should I miss my uh, mother's 80th birthday in order to take Sally to the lacrosse game? on Sunday. How, how would you advise a friend? Also, um, go forward in time and say, how will this look in six months? How will this look in six years or 20 years? How will I view this problem then? Because it, again, it is incredibly hard to sort of step back and see what's important when you're in the thick of it. One friend said to me, whose three kids were all in sports, she said, this town conspires to make you lose perspective. And if you understand that, that that going in, it might be a little easier to maintain some distance when you're in the thick of it. It's important for parents to skip games every now and then. It's good for two reasons. One is it helps you parents, us parents, um, kind of carve out our own activities and interests so that we're not completely wrapped up in there our kids' pursuits. It's also good for kids if you're not there at every game. It's not healthy for children to think that 
They have to have their parents in the stands or watching in order to compete, to play. Again, kids' sports are meant to be for kids. If they can't play when you're not there, that there's something sort of unhealthy going on there. And I think probably most parents can recognize that. And I understand the desire to watch because it, it's fun when your child is good and it's exciting and your friends are there and it all feels like fun. Over the long term, it's healthier to put a little distance between you and your child's sport, not only for yourself, but for your child. I appreciate the, um, the challenge it must be for parents whose kids want to quit, especially if they've invested hundreds of hours, thousands of dollars in their kids' sports. I appreciate that that must be difficult because it feels like a sunk cost at that point. But kids' sports are for kids and they need to be the ones making these decisions because they're the ones playing. The more parents spend on their kids' sports, the less kids like them and the less, um, the less they feel an intrinsic desire to play. If they want to quit, it could very well be because either they never liked the sport in the first place and they were kind of bamboozled into it, or they've played for so long and they specialized for too many years that they're sick to death of it. In which case, I just get out of the way. It's going to happen eventually. At some point, kids who've been playing these sports for too long are going to have to stop playing. And if they want to quit when they're in high school, I would get out of the way and invite them to try other activities. There's more to life than sports. A good coach is a good manager. A good manager is a good coach. And I, the main qualities are to demonstrate strength and warmth. Strength shows players that you know what you're doing, that you're competent, that they, you're the right person to follow. Warmth shows that you care about them. And if kids or employees feel that you don't care about them, they're going to be less apt to care about you or their job. Um, that, that's just a basic principle. Also, with coaching and as with being an employer um, or a manager, you have to model what you want to see among your staff. If you come in late and every day and then get angry when people turn up 15 minutes after they're supposed to arrive, that just sends a terrible message. I know as a coach, I couldn't possibly be indifferent to the sport and expect my girls to care about it. You just have to care yourself. You also have to be scrupulously fair especially with the, um, the top performers, because they're the ones who, it's certainly in athletics, it, it's easy for coaches to look the other way if they violate a rule where there's nothing more undermining of team unity than that kind of uneven distribution of the rules or uneven application of the rules. Also, uh, I think you need to meet them where they are. Sometimes with coaches, you get teams that Maybe they're not full of naturally talented kids or they're beginners or whatever. They're not the star team you might have hoped for. You got to meet them where they are. And likewise, um, uh, managers, you know, maybe this wasn't the hire you wanted. Maybe you inherited this, these employees. You got to meet them where they are and do the best you can with who you have, not who you wish you had. Finally, I think um, it's very tempting as a coach to... Uh, celebrate the successes of the most uh, talented people, the one who scored the goal or ran the fastest. And I think likewise in business, you know, it's celebrating the most successful, the most successful performers. But if you want to have a, a team that works together, that has a common goal and purpose and is united, you have to recognize everyone's contribution, including the slowest kid on the team in running or the one who's the reluctant scorer, or everyone needs to be recognized for their contribution and celebrated. I'd say there's a lot that surprised me. One is the unanimity among researchers, especially in the medical community, about how terrible all of this is for kids. My research or my interest in the subject came from my own sort of hunch about what was happening. And then when I explored it, 
and talk to doctors and researchers, I found that it's pretty unanimous that the way we're doing things is bad for kids and not great for families. Specialization, it may result in some kind of honeypot in college down the road, but short-term and even for kids' long-term health, it's not great. And I was very surprised at the unanimity among the medical community. I was also surprised, frankly, about the results of one study that looked at Division I athletes who, you know, the Division I athletes are the most competitive, um, the most vaunted athletes in college that looked at them later in life. And, and the researchers, research team found that later in life, those players were less active, had worse moods, worse physical functioning, less social, social satisfaction than their contemporaries in college who hadn't played a varsity sport. You know, really gave me pause about, wow, what is this about college sports? Why are we like celebrating them so much when down the road, it's not even necessarily good or great for those young people when they're adults. Those were just two things that surprised me, but there was plenty of surprises along the way.